can add this to Liana's bad takes. Really, my guy? Really? And the main character is so stupid, I just couldn't believe it. Hey guys, it's Liana, and I'm here today with my September wrap up. 13 books. So, not quite as many as the last couple months, but pretty freaking solid, I think, especially because some of these are kind of long. All right, well, then, without any, without any further ado, let me go ahead and tell you how I felt about all these things that I read. Well, yeah, this wasn't actually, I mean, there were, there were high highs and low lows this month, so this is gonna be a bit of a, an emotional roller coaster. Also, people, my neighbors decided to start using the hot tub like five minutes ago. So, uh, I'm really hoping they don't decide to like also start playing really loud music, but it is what it is. The first book that I read in September was Middle Game by Seanan McGuire. Um, I recently heard someone talk about how they much they hated this cover. The someone is Jess. Jess, if you're watching, <laughs> I disagree. The only reason I actually wanted to read this was because of the cover. It just looks so, I don't know, eerie and mysterious and it stands out. Like when you look at a bunch of uh, fiction covers, like this one catches your eye as like being very different from all the others. So the only other Seanan McGuire book that I've read, to my knowledge, because they write under a bunch of different pseudonyms. So to my knowledge, the only book that, or at least the only other book I've read that was officially authored by Seanan McGuire is the first in the Wayward Children series. The Every Heart a Doorway, I, I do believe it's called. Was not a big fan. I didn't hate it by any means, but I just, I don't know. I felt actually, <laughs> middle game ended up being, my experience with it very similar to Wayward Children, except worse. And the worstness, I think, is directly proportional to the length. So Wayward Children didn't have time, because it's a really short book, to like aggravate me, because it is limited in what it can do in that many pages. Middle Game was like same to me as that. It just spent much longer doing things that I weren't that I wasn't a huge fan of. I don't know. This book gets a lot of love, and I, I honestly don't understand why. There are some books. This is why, like, I have some reviews titled "I Don't Get It." Because there are some books where I'm like, this is not for me, but I get, like, honestly, books like, ugh, like, uh, From Blood and Ash or Serpent to Dove, a part of me, a very small part of me, kind of gets it. Because it's this, like, pulpy, soapy, like, really oversaturated romance thing that, like, I think is awful. I don't think the plot's very good and I don't like the people involved. But I kind of get the like soap opera appeal of it if you're kind of living vicariously through it and if you're like into the smutty bits like I guess I get it uh kind of a, a little bit but there's other books like this one where I'm like I honestly I don't get it I don't get it okay so what is middle game I don't even know how to explain it I realize now why I didn't really know that much about it going into it uh even though I'd seen a lot of people pick it up because it's a really difficult book to explain but so um okay um i guess the easiest is that there are two young people who there's like a lot of background for this but and i don't want to be spoilery but so there's there's these two young people that are special <laughs> and they are uh connected from birth but they are separated at birth and they're named roger and dodger which i know is what pisses jess off it makes sense in the book why their names okay i okay it doesn't make sense but there is a reason. It's not just like their names are Roger and Dodger and like that's it. And everyone was, just goes with how silly that is. It's like called out in the text, like ostensibly a reason, a reason why that is a thing that their names like rhyme like that. But anyway, so these two young people, a girl and a guy, Roger and Dodger, Roger being the guy, Dodger being the girl, they, even though they're separated at birth, they like are able to psychically link and so they kind of regard each other as kind of like imaginary friends when they're kids. Well, one of them does anyway, but that's kind of how it's kind of what they are. But there's like bigger things at play, like the reason that they were separated at birth, like, you know, the, the bigger powers that did this to them that have a stake in them and in what they can do begin to affect their lives. And that's, yeah, I don't really know what else I can say without like going into the details of what this book is about and then we get into spoiler territory. And it would just like take this entire video to like explain this because it's like a really really weird book <laughs> but anyway um i initially was into it when it was like just them as kids and they had just discovered this kind of connection between them and were talking to each other and that like that portion of the book 
I was like kind of into it. And I was like, okay, like, I think I'm gonna like this. I didn't realize that that would be like the peak liking. Like I thought I was like, oh, this, this is good. And then I was excited for it to get better, except it didn't. It, <laughs> that was the good part. So once it got very into its like speculative part of it, uh, it totally lost me. And I wasn't that into it to begin with. So like initially I liked the characters of Roger and Dodger and like I was invested in them and in their like relationship. I say relationship, but it's it's a pretty platonic one. So their friendship and their, yeah, I mean, it is a relationship, but they're very significant to each other. But when they grew up and the more the plot got wibbly wobbly, the more everything annoyed me and they annoyed me. And the whole thing was just so bananas and I just couldn't buy into any of it. <laughs> I was just like, no, just no. So I believe this is getting a sequel um, or at least a spinoff. Or, or I saw another book that looks like it has the same cover or a similar in style cover that is also by Sean and McGuire. It's, an, it's a stunning cover. <laughs> and I, I was excited to want to read it just thinking that before I actually read Middle Game. And now I, I'm, unless I hear from people who dislike Middle Game and for some reason pick that book up and are like, this one's actually really good, I will not be picking that up. So uh, y'all be seeing this on Pango soon. Sorry, that was a horrible explanation. But like, honestly, like, if you have read it, I feel like you can agree with me. And if you haven't read it, but you now do pick it up, I think you'll agree that like, you can't really explain it. It's bananas. The next book that I read was The Maidens by Alex McHale, Mc Michaelides. Michaelides? I feel like I, I learned how to pronounce it after putting this on my TBR and then the month has gone by and I forgot again. I think it's Michaelides. Alex Michaelides? Whatever. Alex. <laughs> this is a uh, very obviously Dark Academia. If you watch my Dark Academia vlog, majority of that vlog, or at least the reading portion of that vlog, was devoted to the maidens. And I kind of went in depth in that vlog talking about it. So I don't have like a standalone review for this, but I did kind of go over my thoughts about this a lot in that vlog. Um, so I don't want to like beat a dead horse. Um, this book has gotten a lot of, like a lot of hype and then a lot of criticism from people that did pick it up. And I liked it better than a lot of people seem to have, but there's a very specific reason I think that I came away from it slightly better satisfied, even though I still think it's a really deeply flawed book. So this is Dark Academia. It takes place in a university. It take, There's like this sort of secret society-ish type situation. Uh, these women who have this like charismatic professor and they refer to themselves as the maidens. And once again, we have Greek classics. Um, the POV character is a former student. She's uh, a group therapist. So we have like weaving in of mental health and therapy and psychology uh, with also like Greek classics and murder. And I, um, as it was going along, I felt like it was a very surface level in terms of what it was drawing on for psychology as well as for Greek classics. I feel like if you were an expert in either of those things, you'd be like, wow, this is some, like basic 101 stuff, like not nothing that like experts would be hitting on. So like I was like, eh. <laughs> but like I thought it set a good mood and I thought it was very uh, like very page turny. So like even as I was going along and thinking it was flawed, I was like zipping through it because it, it was it, ha it was vibey. And I wanted to know the mystery. So I thought it was it was compellingly written, even if it was poorly written, if that makes sense. And then people have criticized the main character. And the thing is, I don't disagree with their criticisms. I just, where I where I differ is that I don't feel like, the, the, the way that people talk about this character, they seem to approach it with the assumption that the author wants you to think this character is intelligent and is smart and is, is making good choices. And that's where I differ. I feel like there's an, there are signals in the text to the reader that you are meant to find the main character to be flawed, that you are meant to question their judgment, that you are meant to think that they are not necessarily a reliable narrator even. So that's where we differ basically. So like the way I've heard people criticize it has been like, and the main character is so stupid. I just couldn't believe it. The way they talk about it, it makes it sound like they think the author thinks the character is smart and I don't think that's the case. I was reading it the entire time thinking that the main character is sus. And I'm thinking, again, there are a lot of signals that I thought that were intentional. Like the author put them there to make you go, oh, can I even trust my POV character? So that's why it didn't bother me that the POV character seemed like to me making wild decisions and wild emotional conclusions. Because people are like, she's like such a bad detective. She makes these wild leaps. And I was like, I don't disagree. I just think that like that's a feature, not a bug, if that makes sense. I think she's meant to be perceived that way. So, I mean, 
Maybe I'm giving Alex too much credit. That's how I interpreted it. So it definitely added to my enjoyment that that's how I was experiencing it. If I had gotten the vibe that these other readers have, that you're meant to think she's smart and clever, and then I would be annoyed AF, but I just didn't get that vibe. I didn't think I was meant to think that. So I think it's a fun page turny read. I don't think it's a, a very good book, but I do think it's an enjoyable book. So like I flew through it very quickly and enjoyed my time with it. I just, I mean, it has a lot of flaws and like the, the ending to it, the conclusion, the answer to the mystery is, I don't know if it makes a ton of sense. So it's not like a book that I'd want to reread. It's not one of those where you like find the answer and you're like, oh, now I got to go back and like see all the clues that I missed. Like I, I finished it and I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever. So I had a good time. I don't think it's great. But if you've got it, if you've had your own, if you're curious, like I say read it. It's short. I flew through it in a day. So if you want some Dark Academia vibes, this will do it. Next up I read The Mary Shelley Club by Goldie Maldowski. This I also talked a lot about in my Dark Academia vlog, so I mean, even though I ended up talking a ton about the maidens, I kind of don't want to talk too much about this. Um, I also talked about this in a recent recommendations video, I think maybe possibly. <laughs> this is basically kind of horror Dark Academia thriller type situation. It's YA. Um, it takes place in this like sort of elite school and there is this club that they call themselves the Mary Shelley Club because they've taken their inspiration from the night on which Mary Shelley, along with Percy Shelley and Byron and I think there was another person there. But anyway, the night that Frankenstein basically came to be because they had challenged each other to tell scary stories and Frankenstein was the scariest. Even though this club has like pretty much nothing to do with that. They call themselves that because of that. But what this club does is pull pranks on people outside of the club. And those pranks are largely inspired by like horror and like in horror movies and the horror genre. Like they're all big horror buffs. They love watching horror. And so they're basically like enacting it IRL to kind of see if like the things in horror movies would be genuinely scary in real life. So they kind of challenge each other to this. Now, our main character is like new to the school, experienced something traumatic. So she's like recently become kind of addicted to horror, which she was using as a kind of a coping mechanism to kind of like face her fears. So now she's kind of addicted to horror. So she immediately wants to join the Mary Shelley Club, which is a secret club. And um, things kind of just like escalate from there. <laughs> Initially, I was not a big fan of this. Uh, when I started, I was like, I don't think I'm gonna like this. But as it went on, it grabbed me and by the end I was like OMG 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 because at first I was like for a, a horror book for a thriller this is neither horrific nor thrilling I don't feel any suspense I don't feel any interest or investment but as, again as it went on I was like oh oh there's something darker afoot oh my goodness I ended up having a really good time with this and I ended up giving it uh, basically with the maidens I gave it three and a half and lowered it to a three this I would have given three and a half but I raised it to a four so it's like a higher three and a half so yeah I, I would recommend this uh, yeah next up I read The Inheritance of Orcadia Divina I think I got it right this time the title by Zoraida Cordova this I buddy read with Angela from the Literature Science Alliance she liked it a whole heck of a lot better than me kill Zubriz I am the hardest to please I didn't hate this I just I thought that the beginning and I thought that the premise were far more interesting than the book ended up being. And when I talked to Angela about it, there were a lot of things about it that like, because this is not something that I, uh, this is not an experience that I've had. So it's not something that I even noticed. So I had sort of like retroactively slightly greater appreciation for some of the things that it was doing in terms of like representation of like um, it's a Hispanic family. And there's just like various like specifics about how that family is depicted that Angela uh, zeroed in on and like it wouldn't have occurred to me because I have never I mean I've, I've known a lot of Hispanic people but I've never like lived in a Hispanic household or really been uh felt like I had any kind of pressures that come from like uh internally to like that culture if that makes sense so like I wouldn't notice that it's being depicted one way or another if that makes sense so again when she was describing things that she was noticing about it I was like oh I mean retroactively like that's interesting but as I was reading it I was just this is a story about a family and this is and this family is not that interesting to me and then like the way that it was structured and paced I felt like was to its detriment like I feel like there was a, a was a compelling way to do this and this wasn't it because the big sort of mystery that is kind or I guess it's a mystery, basically the inheritance of Arcadia Divina. So she's this matriarch and she's like kind of magical-ish. And now like her time is upon her. And so the, the family is gathered because, you know, got to say bye-bye because she's dying. But now we also kind of have to like figure out where her magic kind of came from in the first place. And now that they've sort of inherited 
their their portion of it kind of it doesn't it's not exactly like that but kind of like that they have to basically like her past is kind of like caught up with her uh descendants rather than with her because she's dead <laughs> so i just feel like I never felt like this was mysterious. I never felt intrigued by any kind of enigma about it. And I feel like it's partly because everything is kind of like told to you up front and nothing is really held back other than sort of like the answer to like kind of Orcadia's backstory. But her backstory was not, it just, it didn't feel mysterious or enigmatic is all I can say. And I kept wanting it to. I kept waiting to feel like absorbed in this mystery and absorbed in the sort of like strangeness of things and I was excited to have something that would be kind of like inexplicable but clearly a little bit magical and and it just I never felt the magic or the mystery of it so like the whole time I was just like it's fine I, I don't I don't feel like I care about any of this <laughs> and I think again the way it's paced and the way that information is like disclosed to you the like timing of that and I don't know. I just feel like there are ways to like, that things could have been held back more or could have been, uh, I mean, I talked to Angela a lot about this and some of it is like, I mean, it's specific to the book. So you'd have to be reading it for me to be like, so see at this moment. Um, so, but just like broad strokes, like throughout, I was like, I wish this had been written a bit differently. Cause I feel like there's something like there at its core, this is a story I'd be interested in. And I just, yeah. So it's fine. It's not a bad book. There are things about it that I like. I did think that like there there was the very lush and beautiful prose, which I liked from the get go. It was quite atmospheric at times, um, not in the way that I wanted it to be, not in the very, very magical and mysterious way. But there was definitely a sense of like, I can taste the food in this scene. I can see the, the image that you're painting for me. The family kind of each, they, for such a short book, they do kind of have distinct personalities. So there's just some prose for you since I only gave you cons. So yeah, I mean, I didn't love it. Um, Angela, I think, I don't know if she loved it, but definitely liked it a whole heck of a lot more than I did. So trust her, not me, I guess. That's I'm harder to please. <laughs> Next up, we'll do these together because I read them back to back. I read, well, I reread The Trouble with Peace. And then even though this wasn't part of the plan or part of my TBR, I immediately read The Wisdom of Crowds by Joe Robert Crombie. And um, this was the highlight of my month. This was the highlight of my year. The Trouble with Peace, rereading it was phenomenal. It was my, as of its release, it was my new favorite Abercrombie book. It dethroned all its predecessors. So the pressure was on for Wisdom of Crowds. I was like, are you going to dethrone Trouble with Peace? And uh, I have a review up where uh, the thumbnail is that I cried. Abercrombie has never squeezed tears from me before. So that's a new high, a new low. It's new anyway, for him to achieve that if that's an achievement. So uh, I have a full review on my channel. The first half is a non-spoiler or the first part of it anyway is a non-spoiler. I don't know if it's exactly half but you can check it out even if you haven't read it. Um, but then again the bulk, I think the bulk of the review is spoilery where I explain why for I cried. Uh, but yeah this is probably my new favorite Abercrombie book. It's I, as again I addressed in that video I was like it's kind of weird to say that your favorite is the one that makes you cry. <laughs> but uh, it was chef's kiss worth the wait i hyped it for myself more than it's possible to hype anything and it's still lived up so my year is over now because the, my whole year was leading up to this and this is done now so good night everybody uh, the next book that i read was the goblin emperor by katherine addison and i mean <laughs> when i told uh well, this is the blades of bottom strippers book club pick i picked it so the live show is on my channel this is my fault. I, d I say fault. I didn't hate this, but I did not love it. And when we talked about it on the live show, and I mentioned that, I mean, I did read it right after Wisdom of Crowds, which like certainly didn't help the juxtaposition there of like the best book of the year, the best book ever. And then, then to read this, I mean, anything I read after would certainly pale in comparison. However, I don't think that if I had read this at a different time, I would feel any differently. It, it didn't really change anything. Um, so again, we have the live show on my channel if you want to see us talk about it. Bethany and Mara liked it a lot more than I did. I mean, actually, Amanda, like, I mean, they all liked it better than I did. Kill Supremes. This is a, I don't know, what do I even say? So this is a fantasy book. It's an adult fantasy book. It's an award-winning fantasy book. It was the Locus Award winner, and then it was a finalist for Nebula and Hugo, and a finalist for World Fantasy. I'm just like, really? Her? It's Because it, it's not a bad book, but when you see, like, all of those accolades... 
you're like really there was nothing better out that year when people talk about this being like a very like political book i mean i honestly i disagree because the level of politicking here is not very intricate this book is about one character that is the only character that like actually gets development and it's about that character basically being a fish out of water and when we say politics it is more the politics of etiquette the politics of status the politics of fashion the politics of tradition and courtly life that he is navigating um, and he's uh, at a disadvantage both because he was kept away from it and because he is um, halfling so most of these people are elves he's half goblin so like racism and that's the entire book i i kid you not i just told you the entire book that and and yeah that's it and just like a lot lots of that so if that sounds great to you then absolutely pick it up but if you're like seriously that's it don't read it because i'm, I'm not kidding that's it so like the prose is fine correct use of the and thou a plus for that um there are i guess there's like one piece of the world building that I was genuinely interested in and then it's like not even a big part of the book and apparently the spin-off book is like really to do with that which I'm kind of more interested in I don't know if I trust this author because I didn't love this but that was the piece of it that I was like ooh, and then they just like went away and that we're like oh we're not doing that in this book and I was just like but that one was interesting so I might pick up witness for the dead because that was like again the one piece of the world building that I was like oh I've never seen that before tell me men we're done with that okay so I, I, this is another I, I don't get it next up i read reread dune by frank herbert and this edition is shiny af apologies for that my pretty one i gave to my dad which i think i mentioned in my tbr video so reread this for obvious reasons the same reason everyone else is reading this right now because of the movie and i felt about it the second time exactly the same as I felt about it the first time. Which is to say, it's fine. I mean, it's an extremely mixed bag for me because as I said when I first read it, I think it's a classic for a reason. I think it deserves to be a classic and it was a trendsetter, a genre progenitor. It is all of those things. I'm just holding it down because it's so fucking shiny, but okay, I'll hold it here. And, and that being the case, like it deserves credit. But have other authors taken these ideas and done these, I does, done these things better, written them more compellingly? less like in in less problematic ways yes so they could not have done those things i mean frank herbert walked so that they could run which is why i'm like credit where it's due like he started it he no one was doing this no one had done this so like a plus credit where it's due and it's good to sort of see the roots of this and admire it for the innovation that it was but like i mean the first airplane i think I, oh, I i i forgot about this but i genuinely think this was my comparison when i reviewed this years ago so i really seriously did feel the exact same way because like i independently arrived at that comparison again but the first airplane <laughs> that was ever invented it was the first and without that you couldn't have like what we have today but is it the best would you want to fly in one now no so credit where it's due this was the first and there are things about it that are still good, that I still even think are enjoyable. But there's so much about it that I, is not enjoyable and that could be, like, if this was, if I was allowed to, like, take a hatchet to it and edit the shit out of it um, and change a lot of the pacing, I mean, well, it would suit my taste anyway. Obviously, the people who think this is a perfect masterpiece would murder me for doing that. But I'm just saying, like, there's a lot here that's really good. And I just, there's, it's baffling to me. A lot of the decisions that are made in terms of again how to structure it how to pace it how to convey this information to the reader i'm like this is cool stuff that you've built this is cool information there's like a cool overarching like thing that's happening here you've done some cool world building the way you're delivering this to the reader like like why are you burying the lead <laughs> why are you doing it in a way to make something that is actually so interesting you're making it boring and you're making it a tour and you're yeah anyway i have a lot of issues with that and then also like issues with things that like i guess you could say they haven't arranged well i don't know that they were fine even at the time <laughs> that are just like oh oh no i mean the the biggest like elephant in the room is baron harkonnen you're just like really my guy really so like again stuff like that where i'm just like i don't know how you could defend that as being like a great part of a perfect masterpiece because I'm like, it's not perfect because it has that in it. <laughs> That's indefensible. <laughs> so 
Anyway, I I mean, I like that I got a refresher on it. I will be very interested to see how, what Denis Villeneuve does with this, how faithful it is and which parts he will choose. I mean, we already know that Fade Rotha is not going to be in the film, but the film's also only really like the first half of Dune and Fade Rotha does not play a big role in the sort of first half of the book. So that doesn't necessarily mean that he's taken Fade Rotha out of the equation entirely. So I mean, I'll, again, I'll just be curious to see what liberties he's taken with the story. Uh, he's an excellent director, so I have great faith that whatever he gives us will be quality unto itself, regardless of how faithful it is to the source material. Whew. Okay, the next book that I read was Nevermore. Uh, the first book in the, um, is the series called The Trials of Morgan Crow? Or is that just like part of the title? Well, regardless, this is the first book um in a series and this is a buddy read with vish from books with v and both of us really enjoyed this and both of us intend to continue on with the series i already oh, both of us actually have all of the books already and it's kind of what it happened and this is just an absolutely charming middle grade fantasy book it has like a lot of the sort of like escapist whimsy and humor that uh people go to harry potter for and for those of us who are like mm, not comfortable with reading harry potter anymore because of reasons and but you kind of want to like scratch that itch uh, I think Nevermore is a good option. I actually, I mean, I have heard a lot of people say that and I would basically, I'm saying I would concur. It very much scratches that itch. You have like the fun whimsical setting that is kind of this like, kind of a portal fantasy. It doesn't like take place in the real world and then we go to a fantastical place. But there is a even more fantastical place than where our character is from. And there are some like quirky adults and there are some interesting, bizarre things about how this magic works. The main character, which is a thing that is uh, also true of Harry Potter books, and which is upsetting to me that it, it was not, it never made it into the movies, is how snarky the main character is. Because I mean, in the books, Harry is kind of really snarky. And that's kind of one of the things that I liked the best about it was like his like kind of low-key deadpan snark, which again, isn't in the movies at all. So the main character, Morgan Crow, is kind of snarky and kind of sassy. And like you get that from her from like chapter one. And as soon as I started this book, I was like, I don't know if I will end up liking this book or not. It's way too early to tell, but I know that I like Morgan Crow. So she like, the book would be fine if she wasn't so great, um, but it, it's really like Morgan Crow herself that makes this book a delight. So I definitely, definitely enjoyed this. And again, I'll definitely continue with the series and I would recommend. The next book I read, which might be a surprise, and this was not, well, it is a surprise because it wasn't on my TBR, <laughs> but it's a surprise for another reason. Um, and that was Over the Woodward Wall by Deborah Baker, who is in fact, Seanan McGuire. So this book in Middle Game, the young people, because in Middle Game takes place like ostensibly in the real world. Um, it's is it urban fantasy? I don't know, but it's in the real world. And there's a book that is a children's book that they have both read and like it becomes significant to the plot. It's just like a book in universe. So this is that book. So in the characters in Middle Game have read Over the Woodward Wall. They talk about it the way we would talk about Alice in Wonderland or The Wizard of Oz. So this is that book. And I liked this initially a great deal. I thought that I was going to come away going, well, Middle Game was horrible, but I'm so glad that like, I mean, that middle game exists because without middle game, we wouldn't have gotten over the Woodward Wall. However, the latter half of Over the Woodward Wall kind of went off the rails. And I thought it was a standalone because this book, as far as I remember in middle game, is always referred to kind of as like a standalone book, just the way that like Peter Pan or uh, Alice in Wonderland is. I mean, there is through the looking glass, but like, it's like a book. Um, and this is actually the start of a series. I thought this would wrap up conclusively and it absolutely did not. So like that would have been at least like a solid full circle payoff and then we didn't even get that. It just like went off the deep end and then stayed in the deep end because we never like made our way back out again. So I did enjoy this more than middle game. The writing style did have more of the sort of like whimsy and had that Alice in Wonderland kind of vibe. So I enjoyed it again a great deal to begin with and then, then it just stopped making sense altogether and the characters no longer were interesting or compelling to me and it was just wild. So I do I recommend, it's extremely short. So like maybe give it a go. Um, if you already like Sean and Maguire, um, maybe read it, but like. <sniffs> Next up I read The Ivies by Alexa Dunn. This is my first Alexa Dunn and I liked it. I didn't love it, but I kind of feel about this similarly as I did The Maidens where, um, although this has less concrete flaws and is more just kind of like, not that great a book, but 
I just had a great time with it. Like I kept, I was interested the entire time. And even though I think, again, I don't think it is that it is breaking any boundaries. I don't think the plot is that innovative or creative. I don't think there's anything that clever about it. I don't think the characters are like extremely deep in their characterization or anything like that. But it's written in a way that is like page turny where you like want to know the mystery, where you keep wondering who did the doing of the whodunit. It's dark academia. So like you have that vibe um, of this like elite school and people being cutthroat. So it was, it was a good time. So yeah, I wouldn't go like, oh, this book is amazing. I was just like, oh, that was a good time. Like I flew through it and it's really short. Um, but I also just flew through it because it was compelling. And I think I said this in my TBR that I was hoping um, that it might give off kind of like fourth season of Riverdale vibes, um, which is the season which Jughead goes to an elite boarding school. Uh, and there is a kind of like dark academia subplot in Riverdale. And I was like, if it gives off dark academia Riverdale vibes, I'm here for it. And funnily enough, I mean, I would say it kind of did. Honestly, Mary Shelley Club more so gave off uh, Riverdale vibes. But again, funnily enough, in the Ivies, they mention Riverdale, um, which I thought was hilarious because as soon as I heard that, I was just like, I feel attacked. Because, like, that's what I compared it to before even reading it. So that was kind of a fun moment for me personally. Any hoosies, if you're in for, like, a soapy, gaspy time, I think this will deliver. Like, don't expect too much from it is basically what I'm saying. It's a good time. It's not an amazing time. It's not a great time. But, I mean, it was enjoyable. It kept me turning the page. Second to last, I read... Tigana by Guy Gabriel K. And this is the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog for them. So I have done so. And uh, I gave this two stars. <laughs> so you can add this to Liana's bad takes. I don't think I'll be posting like a standalone review because I kind of like got it all out when I was vlogging. And I just don't feel like revisiting that. Plus, I've been burned so many times posting negative reviews of extremely popular books and then having to deal with unreasonable people who take personal offense at the fact that I disliked a book that they did not write. But yeah, this was not, not for me. For many, many reasons. I didn't think the prose was all that good. There was even a sentence that, that I distinctly remember. I think there was more than one, but one that I distinctly remember was grammatically incorrect. There was a lot of sentence, like the construction of sentences where it was just clunky and didn't flow. And I was like, this is supposed to be beautiful prose? Like this, I'm stumbling over all of these sentences. It was constantly telling and not showing. And the characterization was like very weak in my opinion. They felt like cardboard cutouts. And then the main thing that Tagana is about, the, the fact like the, the overarching, like what is Tagana? What is it that people are kind of doing here? I take borderline personal offense at, which I don't really want to talk too much about, um, but I am, I don't, it would bother me a great deal. So I was just never going to be on board with this, or at least not the way that it is written. I think you could write something like this with similar themes in a way that I would adore. This wasn't it. This again was borderline personally offensive to me. So yeah, not, not a win for me. And last I read Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. I did start this early in the month, but I only just finished it today. <laughs> this is the first book in the Peculiar Children series. And this is a series that I've been wanting to start for a very long time, mainly because of the aesthetic of it. It just looks like it would be my jam. And the main thing that I enjoyed about it was the aesthetic. All of these like photographs that are peppered throughout, like, like so, which I learned at the end of the book. I was wondering, I was like, did they hire actors for this? But they are all actual real old photographs that like people have collected and he used. So basically this is like a jukebox musical, except instead of songs, they are photographs that were kind of working into the plot in a way that like kind of fits like in a jukebox musical where the lyrics are already written for you and you kind of build a story around them. And it feels like it. <laughs> I didn't know that it, like as I was reading it, I was just like, I didn't find it all that compelling. And then when I learned that these photographs just already existed and he was weaving a story around these existing photographs, I was like, oh, well, maybe that explains it. Yeah, I just, I kept wanting to like it and I didn't ever hate it. There was no point where I was hating it. It just failed to keep my interest. I just wasn't invested in anything going on. I wasn't particularly invested in the main character. The thing I liked best about it was the times when it would call attention to these photographs and I would have reason to look at them and to kind of really examine them. And there was a moment when we kind of got the big reveal on like kind of what the big bad is. And that was like a bit spine tingling, I will admit. But I was like, I, when I got to that, I was like, oh, okay, now off we go. Is like disappointed, which from here on out, I'm going to be riveted and absolutely not. I got I went right back to being bored. I saw the movie when it came out ages ago and obviously at the time I had not read the book. And I remember, I saw it in theaters and I remember liking it but not loving it. I remember feeling like 
I did get kind of bored with it. So I was really hoping I liked the book better. And I obviously didn't. But I did we'll just rewatch the movie after having read the book. And um, it had been so long. It was almost a new movie. There was like a couple scenes that it just like stuck out in my memory. And honestly, those were scenes that aren't in the book. So part of me when I was reading the book, I was like, is that gonna happen ever? Guess not. But so yeah, no, immediately after I finished the book, I watched the movie. And I liked the movie a whole heck of a lot better now. Like I, I genuinely kind of love the movie a lot more than like I felt about the movie now the way that I had hoped to feel then. And I don't know if I was just like in a weird mood when it came out or like, or what, but I really liked it now. And I think a lot of the changes it makes to like from the source material are good changes. The biggest change being the main character. He's kind of the worst. Like not so much that I kept like actively hating him, but he's kind of the worst. He's like very privileged and very whiny about it. And he's kind of insufferable. Not in such a way where you're constantly aggravated by it, but like he kind of is. Like it's really hard. That's, that's I feel like that's why I didn't connect with him because it was just really hard to like find sympathy for him. Whereas they, they kind of took away a lot of the things that he does and says in the book, in the movie version, making him immediately more sympathetic because he wasn't such a twat. So um, I think I'll continue the series. I own the next two books as I'm kind of, I mean, the movie kind of ends and the movie is kind of similar and kind of faithful until it takes uh, a sharp left turn and does its own thing. And I don't know if the thing that it does is drawn from other books or if it just like was Tim Burton being like, I want to do this. Because where this ends like is very different from how the movie ends. So I'd be curious to see kind of where the books go. And I, I own them already and I like looking at the pictures. So I'll give, I'll keep going and see if it gets better. Um, but the first book, I uh, it was, it was all right. And those are all the books that I read in September. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about the books that I read and about your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. <laughs> Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well. I'm definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye. <laughs>